shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give
in your presence. Teach us how to rest in you, God. Teach us how to teach us how to be in your presence, God. As busy as everything is, rushed as everything is, God, I pray, Lord, that you teach us how to be in your presence. I thank you, God, for this church, for this family, for, for, for the way that you're moving here, God. And may, you, may we be ready when you call us, God, to say we're ready to go. We're ready to, to, to serve. We're ready to love. We're ready to, to be everything you need us to be, God. Because there's a city, there's a community, there's a world that needs you desperately, God. They need to see Christians in action. They need to see us as we love you. They need to see us as, as, as we receive your love, God. They need to see us be your hands and feet, God. Keep moving in this church, God. We love you. Be with this time. In your beautiful name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I was having a conversation this week with someone who's, who has been in El Paso in the past and not anymore. But, uh, and, and in our discussion, we got around to uh, the topic of celebrity Christians which in some people's minds might be an oxymoron or maybe the other way, it should, maybe it's like shouldn't ever go together. But the truth of the matter is that we have in our mindset in the church of the 21st century, at least the American church in the 21st century, we seem to have this mindset that there are some Christians that are a little more elevated than others. And so uh, I, I could get really direct about that, but I don't want you to, well, I have other stuff I need to do this week. So, um, and I think I would spend a lot of time unpacking that for you, but I've had the chance to meet some of these and have discussions, extended discussions with some of these Christian celebrities. If you're old like me, then you'll remember uh, Mark Lowry, who is not kin to David Lowry as far as I know, but... Uh, Mark Lowry sang with the Gaither Quartet and was a comedian and still around, but Teresa and I had a chance to spend uh, several hours with him over the course of a day as we took him to the airport from around the Corpus area. And, uh, you know, he's as funny in person as he is from the stage. But most of that time I was kind of in awe of the fact that I here's this famous Christian who's sitting in the front seat of my car with me. And through the course of that, he made a couple of comments that made me realize he wasn't any different than I am. 
But the conversation about Christian celebrity often gets, just stays there. And we never really go the other direction with that. And so the truth of the matter is that as we elevate some Christians to celebrity status, it is possible that we might lower other people to a less than status. And so if you had that person that you lower to a less than status sitting in your car and they ask you this question, who is this Jesus? How would you answer that? And how could you be consistent with your answer with the follow-up question, which would be, what is the value of being a Jesus follower? I think most of us with the second question would immediately default to, well, it has a great retirement plan. In other words, because I know Jesus is my Savior, then that means that when I die, then I count on him to be faithful, that I have eternity in heaven with him. Okay, that's a good answer. It's excessively incomplete, but it is a good answer. So what is the value in your life of following Jesus? And who is he really? Is he only savior? Is he comforter? Is he king of kings? Who is Jesus to you? And what is the value you find in being a follower of Jesus? I happen to believe 21st American culture and society is asking those questions without using those words. And so the question for us then is how as a church, how as an individual Christian, am I speaking truth and living truth into those circumstances? So we're in Ephesians chapter 2 today, verses 11 and following. And Paul, we pick up Paul's conversation here with that Ephesian church um, about the value of Christ's coming in the first place. And he's had a lot to say, so I'm not going to even try to go back and rework all of that stuff. We'll just pick up in verse 11 of chapter 2. And Paul undeniably affirms that one of the values that Jesus brings into our lives is it provides the opportunity for us to have unity in the church. And he gets there in a really insightful and challenging way for us. Ephesians 2, beginning in verse 11, reads this way. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the, fle in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one, uh, who has made us both one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing hostility. And he came and he preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the spirit. Did you get all of that? Paul has a unique ability to go on and on and on and on. Kind of like some of those people in your life that you stop to talk to and you just can't get away. But Paul in going on and on and on and on just layers truth for us. And so sometimes in a passage like that where you really kind of need the whole passage, it's not easy to take just a verse out of that, although I'm going to do that in a little bit. Uh, but there's just so much in there. That you kind of need to cover all of it at once. And so let's, let's try to do that this morning. Here's a fundamental truth. I'm going to give you two fundamental truths today. Here's the first one. Discrimination is real. 
Now, I know one guy, I knew one guy, who was fond of saying, if, if you think I'm discriminating against you, you're just wrong. I'm not discriminating. I just don't like you. Now, is that acceptable? Especially is that acceptable for a Christian to take a position like that? Have you ever encountered real discrimination? Now, I, I use that clarification word real because some discrimination I think is perceived so let me just take you right down into the bottom shelf happy football season by the way we, we've we've survived to another season and some of you are thinking now we have to survive another season but so some of us love football season so we get here and so uh, over the weekend, high school football kicked off in real, uh, in, in real time for the state of Texas. And uh, one of the things I love about our church, we have so many different people here and different interests and different involvements. And uh, you, whether you know it or not, we have several men in our church who serve as referees, football referees for high school level and, and one at least even for college level here. And uh, it's an interesting world, that is. It takes me back to when I was in the Rio Grande Valley of South Texas. And uh, same deal. We had a guy in our church who had been a football referee for many, many years. He was from Michigan. And uh, he came down with that skill set. He was a banker. And uh, so he came down to the valley and wanted to plug in. And so he did that. And he, he had a position in that referee uh, group that caused him to need a statistician every time. So he was one of the guys who had to keep up with all the stats, how many, you know, that was a first down or that was a penalty, et cetera. And so he asked me one night, he said, hey, uh, tomorrow night, this was a Thursday, he called me and he said, tomorrow night, we're going to be playing, I'm refereeing this particular game, and it was against two of the big teams in the, in the Rio Grande Valley, and he said, I need somebody to run stats for me on the sideline. And I said, oh, 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 pick me, pick me. And he said, that's why I called you, because I, I want you, if you're interested in doing that, I said, I'm interested in doing that, do I get a whistle? <laughs> he said, you get no whistle, but you get a clipboard and a pen. And he said, and so he said, I'll teach you how to do it on the way to the game. <laughs> uh, so I did that, and it was incredibly fun and fulfilling for me. And so I'm running up and down the sideline, and so every time he would say, you know, first down, then I would mark first down there. Or, you know, he'd drop a deal on a turnover and it happened here. And then I had to keep track of how many yards they returned an interception and that kind of thing. So it was just like being right down on the field, except nobody hit you. And that experience became several experiences over the years that I was down there. But one of the things that was common in every one of these, and those of you who are uh, football officials in our church will recognize this to be true, that the coaches are worse than the fans about believing that they're being discriminated against. And so on this one particular game, and it was for hometown, and so I knew most of the coaches there, and uh, this one coach was riding the head referee the whole game. You're just out to get us. You don't like our team. You're just trying to make us lose and that kind of thing. It was just the whole, the whole game. But one of the things it did for me when I sat down with those referees at halftime, by the way, and they're going over the game and they're seeing what adjustments they need to make, I, I got you know, kind of behind the curtain look at how that works. But I was struck with how fair they intend to be. So there is such a thing as perceived discrimination. You hear a lot of that in our world today where people just, and I, I talked about, you know, assigning motive to somebody without really knowing it uh, several weeks ago. And, and so they do that a lot. People do that a lot where they assign motive to somebody when that person takes a position that is not my position. And so, well, you're just discriminating against us. So sometimes that's perceived, but sometimes it's real. There is such a thing as real discrimination. I'll take you back to the Rio Grande Valley, 1953 roughly. Actually stretch forward beyond that, but uh, there was a man in our church whose name was Coach Jim Brooks. And Coach Brooks had been the coach at Pan American University, which became University of Texas 
Pan American and now is University of Texas Rio Grande Valley. But Coach Brooks came into that position in the 50s as an athletic director and coach. And when he came in, he was before there was Glory Road, there was Coach Brooks who in South Texas took a bunch of black athletes from Mississippi and that general area and put them down on his team in the Rio Grande Valley and then traveled across that conference. And he told me one time, I, he was a member of our church when he passed away, and that's when I learned more about him than I ever did while he was alive. And Coach Brooks told me that in one particular instant, uh, instance, they were traveling with this, with this basketball team, and they were in Mississippi, which is a long way from Edinburgh, Texas, I can promise you. And he went in, and he said to a restaurant, he said, I, 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 my team needs to eat and they said well come on bring them in and as these black players walked up to the door the owner stepped to the door and he said you cannot eat here these boys will have to go around back and we'll feed them out the back door there is real discrimination coach Brooks said thanks but no thanks and so they went down to a hamburger joint that served you know like the drive up kind like Sonic is nowadays and he fed those guys there There is such a thing as real discrimination. The question that we probably should ask ourselves is, is that true in the 21st century church? Is it possible that God's people might be discriminatory? If you want a good full answer to that, let's start with the Old Testament, because that's what Paul does. So this passage that we're talking about deals with discrimination in the church at the fundamental level, and that is who can be saved. And we'll get to some of that in just a moment, but let's go backwards a little bit. So in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, and I don't even really probably need to read this because most of us know this passage pretty well, but this is the beginning of of what Paul ultimately is talking about in that passage where he talks about those who are called the uncircumcision by those who are called the circumcision, those who are on the outs with God as opposed to those who are on the ends with God. And so Genesis 12, 1, it says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. Verse 2 goes on to say, And I will make you, I make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I'm going to stop reading there because what we find there is the beginning, as we know it, of this group of people called the children of God who will become known in the book of Exodus as the children of Israel. And we we move on through the Old Testament and we find that time after time. Uh, Ultimately, we get to the book of Exodus, and I go now, you don't have time to turn there, so just you can read on the screen. But in Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 and 6, as God is giving the law to the children of Israel now, coming out of Egypt and slavery, it says this, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples for all the earth is mine and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation these are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel so God says to Abram I'm going to choose you I have chosen you and I'm going to make from you this great nation in in Exodus as he's giving them the rules for the relationship that we call the law God says to them, and if you will do what I tell you, you will be my special possession. So that's the New Testament circumcision group. The mark of the covenant, if you will, group. But by definition, doesn't that sound like it locks people out? But you see, God told Moses to tell them, you will be to me a kingdom of priests. Do you know what a priest does in the Old Testament? He represents God to the people, and he's a go-between between the people and God. A kingdom of priests. So in other words, God's design from the outset was that the children of Israel fulfill their role as being what we call ambassadors for Christ in the New Testament. 
The problem is that Israel of the Old Testament moving into the New Testament took the favor part of this agreement and dismissed the role part of the agreement. And it became this exclusive group for many of them, which set in mind or set in motion a mindset of superiority. We are the people of God, not you. So Paul, as he's talking about what Jesus has delivered because of the cross and the resurrection, he, he emphasizes for his readers that their value in what Jesus has done there is that he's pulled down the separators. He refers to them as Gentiles. You know why he does that? Because they're Gentiles. The very name Gentile for a Jew was a point of the division that you're those who are outside of the covenant. We're the ones who are inside the covenant. And Paul wants these first century Christian Gentiles in Ephesus to recognize that God has said, you are part of his family because of Jesus Christ. So when you go to answer the question for somebody, what is the value of Jesus in your life? Then as a Gentile, and I'm going to guess it probably, I don't know, hundred percent of you in here are Gentiles. If it weren't for Jesus doing that, according to what we find in the way the Jews handled Old Testament truth moving forward, then we would be locked out. But Jesus would have none of that for us. You see the value? That, that, that retirement plan that we love to trumpet for people, the only reason we can say that I, when I die, I get to go to heaven is because of Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And so with that in mind, let me, let me just kind of dig in for a minute on this. Can you think of any instances in Christian churches of our day of an attitude that seems to hold some people at arm's length to say, you're not one of us? Let me just kind of put a, a road trammel working definition for discrimination here based on how I think this passage is handling it. If or when you see or treat someone in a way less than Jesus does, you should be careful because you may well be practicing discrimination against that person. And it might be that some people in our churches Discriminate based on skin color, like Coach Brooks and that team who had to be fed out the back door of a restaurant? Really? Churches of our day make anybody eat from the back door or from down the street because they can't get in to that particular church. Maybe it's their nation of origin. Careful, those are powerful words in 21st century borderlands. Be careful if there's anybody that you see or treat in a way that is less than Jesus would see or treat them because you might just be flirting with I'm the in group and you're not. Verses 11 and 12 help us with this. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Would it be possible that there are still those people in the family of God that might lock some people out? There was a particular town that I served a church in, a particular church in a particular town at a particular time. And there were two other going churches. Okay, I served at what was considered one of the going churches in that town. It was a town of about 30,000 people or so. And uh, our church 
had two other churches. I was told when I got there. Now, this other church, okay, so one of them was First Baptist Church. It was not here. And then the other one had a different name, but it was also a Baptist church. And those three churches competed for members. I, I didn't use the wrong word there, okay? It's not a compliment. They competed for members. And at least two of the pastors of those two churches were cutthroat about that. And so I was nothing other than a youth minister in those days. You know, snotty-nosed, always the guy, you know, everybody has to clean up after. And the youth ministers of the other two churches and I got together, and we decided that this competition between churches was about the dumbest thing we had ever heard in the world. And so we decided we weren't going to compete. As a matter of fact, we decided to start doing some citywide youth events together. And one of the guys from the other church got fired from his job because he, com he worked with us for the cause of Christ. Discrimination happens. It happened in the Old Testament. It happened in the New Testament. And it happens in the 21st century church. And we have to be really careful. And here's one of the reasons it's such a problem. Because what happens is, especially when you're the one who is being discriminated against, okay, not, not perceived against, but real discrimination, when you're the one who's being discriminated against, it causes you to be angry. I don't mean hangry, although that's bad too. I'm talking about a deep-seated anger that bubbles out and also at the same time gets pushed in and causes bitterness. And before it's all said and done, it damages the cause of Christ with his church and their witness. Anger and resentment, which lead to factions and wars. Let me just challenge you. I hope that this sermon lingers for you for a while. Because I want to challenge you to use USA politics over the next two months and listen for genuine discrimination. Listen for anger and resentment and factions that grow out of the rhetoric that we're going to be hearing. Over. We've been hearing it since I was 12. We're going to hear it big time over the next two months and look at what it does look at what it creates it is no small thing that Paul in his treatment of the value of Jesus Christ and what he did gets to the point of this discrimination that had been occurring between these two people groups Jews and Gentiles circumcised uncircumcised and Paul just leans in with them and he says, Jesus did away with the dividers. By the way, if Jesus chose to do that, don't you think it would be the thing to do for the church of our day? And I know some of you are sitting there going, but you don't understand. You don't know what they did to us. I might know more than you think I know about that. But it's not a competition about who knows more. <laughs> why, do we, why do we compete over those kind of things? What does Jesus do? What has Jesus done? And how do we embrace that? So take a moment and survey your world and see if maybe there are evidences that we have slipped a little and adopted a tactic of this world's ways that separates rather than unifies. Paul's writing to a church to say, y'all need to get together and be one because of Jesus. So that's the first big point. Discrimination is real. Here's the second big one, and clearly I won't take much longer to do it, but Jesus destroys discrimination. You go back through this, Verses 11 and 12 help us with that verse, because verse 11 and 12 talk about before Jesus. Verses 14 through 22 talk about after Jesus. So you can go back and you can break it up and see that that way. But verse 13 
is the dividing point between before and after. And it says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. A definitive statement that speaks to the value of what Jesus has done. And if you're one who has been pulled in, how could you justify holding somebody else out? Paul has a lot to say in verse 13, 14, 15 about what Jesus brings into this world that's marked by discrimination. And the summary of all that is that he brings unity from what was division. Don't forget that Paul's addressing Gentile Christians here. They were having trouble with this. And he's saying to them in no uncertain terms that there is a seat for you at the table. So let me kind of drive in. I'll close with this, but let me just kind of drive in. There's a lot more that we could say here, but I talk a lot about circles. So I talk about evangelism or sharing your faith by talking about the circle that God has placed you in. God has strategically placed you in a circle of people who desperately need life. And so I also talk about circles within the church. And so we're about to dismiss here and let you go to your small group Bible study classes. Okay? And one of the things that I say about those small group Bible study classes is that, uh, that that's, that's your church within the church, right? I, I encourage people to go to these small groups because that's where the best pastoral care occurs. That's where the best fellowship occurs. You cannot, okay, I, I, as much as I wish we could figure out a way, you cannot build deep abiding relationships in a one-hour service, or hour and 15 minutes, service, where you come in here and you passively sit and hear the preacher or you join in with the music, but you're not investing yourself in one another. That happens in these small group classes. If you're here today and you're not part of one of those classes and you need a friend, I got a class for you. Actually, I got about 12 classes for you. If you're raising children and you want them to be part of a group who kind of share the values that you have for your child and you want them to know Jesus Christ, we have a children's ministry that is a place to put your kid while you go to one of those other classes I'm talking about and invest your life in other people. But here's what happens. Okay? I see this a lot when we have, have gatherings, you know, and we get together and we sit at our round tables, circles, with people that are in our group. You know why we do that? Because we know those people. We like those people. Well, four out of five. So what happens is, if we're not careful, if we're not always watching this, what happens is we get in our little circle and we're comfortable. And then the new person coming in has no table and no circle. So let me encourage those of you who do that. First of all, keep it up, okay? But let there be a permeable boundary in your circle that allows people in, okay? Always leave at least one open chair at your table. And then look for the table that has a single person sitting there. Or maybe a couple that nobody knows who they are. We all know they're new. Bring them in. This is, this is church fellowship 101. This is basic stuff. But the problem with basic stuff is sometimes it's so basic that we miss it. Paul writes to a church that is doing great things. And he says, you've got a problem here. And the solution is Jesus and the example that he gave us. By the way, Jesus was the one going around allowing tax collectors to be part of his circle and people who had been prostitutes being part of his followers. Jesus is the example, but he's also the one who broke, breaks, broke the barriers. Let's pray. And as we pray... 
my question to you is, so where do you fit in this whole thing? Who is Jesus? What is the value that he brings in your life? Who are the people that you intentionally reach across the dividing line to say, come be part of us? Maybe you're the person who's not part of any group. Maybe you don't even know who Jesus is. What we've tried to do today is lay out for you that he is praiseworthy. What a great music service this morning. We've tried to lay out for you that he has value for your life. You have a place to belong, become a member of his family. But you only do that by coming on his terms, which is to give up control of yourself because that doesn't get you anywhere except separated from God. Let him be Savior and then be Lord and find your place in his family. If you don't understand that, but you know that's going on and you have questions, then this invitation time is for you. Maybe it's a good time for some of us who know these things to kind of double down and reiterate that Jesus has to be part of my everyday life, especially as it comes to reaching across lines that divide people in our churches and in our country. So Father, now we ask that your spirit would work and do your work, even now in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing. I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus lives.